Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Sunday School Hour for Victory Baptist Church on this Sunday, April the 12th, 2020. It is currently 9.58 a.m. Central Time. Uh, I always try to start just a little early because I know it takes people a few minutes to catch up with the live stream, get the notification, uh, pull up their device, all all the different things they have to do to finally start listening to us live. So I I, I like to go uh, early a few minutes, and and it's also hard in this new way of doing church. I know I'm not supp- supposed to say we're doing church, but in this new way of doing things because of the COVID nineteen pandemic, um, it is just so weird sitting here in an empty building, and you're just looking at the clock, and you're like, huh, nine thirty a.m start in 30 minutes, and you're just sitting here looking at the microphone, looking at the computer, and you're like, 9.35, okay, it's supposed to start in 25 minutes, then you just keep looking, 9.40, all right, it's supposed to start here, at 9.45, okay, 15 minutes, and you're just sitting here waiting and waiting and waiting, and you know all you have to do is hit the red go live button, and you could just get started, but I'm trying to keep everything as normal as possible by starting as close to, to the normal time as possible. And we're going to continue doing Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night and Wednesday, and of course, all the other things we're doing. So um, welcome to those who are not members of Victory Baptist Church and listening to us live. Welcome to all the members of Victory Baptist Church. Welcome. It is Sunday. Yes, this is Resurrection Sunday. Um, Some refer to it as Easter. I'm not a fan of that term. Resurrection Sunday, uh, the day set aside to remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As we always say, every Sunday is a day to remember the resurrection of Christ because I've said it so many times, our empty homes is a testimony to the world that we believe the tomb was empty 2,000 years ago. Sadly, today, our homes are not empty and the churches are, but we can still remember the resurrection of Christ and still still celebrate that and remember that um, and continue to pray for everything going on in our world Uh, But let's begin this Sunday School Hour with two hymns, and then we will uh, jump right into the lesson for this hour. Here we go.
All right. I apologize. I went live under the Theology Central podcast. I forgot to change it to the VBC podcast. So once the Sunday School Hour is over, I will have to download the message and then upload it uh, back to the VBC section just to ensure that all the messages are there. And then for the next hour, I will try to remember, I will try to remember to hit that little drop down menu and select VBC for the morning uh, sermon. So um, I apologize for that, but I think everyone uh, now knows where we are. I think everyone has uh, caught on. So we have a lot to do and not a lot of time to do it. Okay, so we're, we're going to be doing a lot of things this morning. Um, if you have, obviously you're listening to me on some kind of device, uh, you may want to have a Google open because I'm going to have you at least search for at least one thing. And then you may want to have, well, it depends. I guess it really depends on what uh, tools you have available on your mobile device. We're going to be uh, looking at a lot of, we're going to be looking at a, a textual variant. We're going to be looking at a lot of Greek tools. So um, I, I hope this will be beneficial. I, I think I think we'll start this way. There are the... Bible study, the, the purpose of Bible study is, is obviously to grow in our understanding and knowledge of God and grow in our understanding and knowledge of the things we are to believe, to grow in, uh, in our understanding of how we are to live and, and to, to grow in our understanding of how we should see the world, how we should see ourselves. Bible study is essential uh, because just reading a text is never sufficient. It's never enough because just reading it, it you, you, you can't really do much with it unless you take the time to actually dig in. And the more you dig in, the more time you're willing to put in, the more work you're really willing to put in, the more you're going to discover, the more you're going uh, to find. And, and I think that is very important. I put it this way um, and, and on in my notes. There are times when there is something very interesting in the Bible, but people can miss it because it can only be discovered by digging in and actually studying the text. There, there are things there, but you have to actually spend the time. You actually have to, to do the work. You actually have to use the tools. And if you don't, well, then your, your knowledge is surface level at best, or even, and here's what's even worse, your knowledge is wrong. <laughs> you, you have a wrong understanding, which nobody should want. Nobody should want. So Bible study is essential. So today, for this hour, we're going to do a little bit of detective work. We're going to do a little bit of exploration, and we're going to try to find, uh, well, try to find out what the truth is and then what that truth could possibly mean. We may not come to any definitive conclusions, but I think the journey and the uh, the research and the study hopefully will be beneficial. And we're going to do this by taking a very familiar story, one that everyone obviously listening, um, if they've read the Bible for any length of time, they, they know this story. Probably even if they didn't never even read the Bible, they probably know this story. We have a famous story in the Bible, uh, and we'll call this the story of Pilate, Jesus, and a man named Barabbas. All right, Pilate, Jesus, and a man named Barabbas. Now, if you know the story, Jesus had been arrested and he had been brought in for questioning with this so-called trial that was taking place. He was being questioned. All kinds of accusations are being made. Finally, he is brought before Pilate. All right. And if you look at, say, John chapter 18, I mean, there's lots of different places we could we could pick up this story. But if you go to John chapter 18, um, I think uh, this is a, a very, a very, I mean, well, every, every account kind of get has its own unique features when you deal with this part of the story. Uh, but I think this this one is very interesting. So in John chapter 18, if you go back to verse 19, the high uh, Jesus is brought before the high priest. He's asked questions uh, of, of, of his disciples and of his doctrine. Uh, Jesus answers, I spoke openly to the world. I even taught in the synagogues and in the temple, uh, whether the Jews always resort. And, and, and in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. So there's this back and forth occurring, all right? The tensions are high. Jesus has been arrested. Now, if you've read 
Obviously, if you read the Bible, you know where this is all going to lead. It's going to ultimately lead to Jesus being crucified. Uh, but so here, he's being questioned. Uh, while he's being questioned, uh, Peter, well, he's he's outside denying Jesus. Uh, but then ultimately, uh, verse starting in verse 28 of John chapter 18, then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. So the Jews, ultimately, they hand Jesus over to Pilate, uh, because uh, Pilate is the the civil authority of Rome. He has certain power that the Jews can't, the Jews can't do the things that they would like to do. Uh, so they turn him over to him. Now, it's interesting. They don't want to go in to defile themselves. So they're worried. They're worried a little bit about certain uh, laws. However, they're they're involved in trying to have an innocent man killed. But that's you know, you, you could say uh, not innocent in their eyes. I guess we could say. Uh, but then John in chapter in John chapter eighteen verse twenty nine, Pilate then went out unto them and said, "What accusations bring you against this man?" They answered and said unto him, "If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him unto thee." Then said Pilate unto them, take ye him and judge him according to your laws. The Jews therefore said unto him, uh, uh, the Jews therefore said unto him, it is not lawful for us to put him, put any man to death. So Pilate doesn't want anything to do with this. He's like, hey, you go take him. You, 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 you go. And they're like, wait, we, we can't put him to death, which kind of demonstrates what they ultimately want, wanted to accomplish. They wanted to have the pretense of a trial, but what they really wanted was to put him to death. Verse 32, um, we'll go back to verse 31. Then said Pilate unto them, take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, it is not lawful for us to put any man to death. That, now this is very important, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Now that's significant because if the Jews were able to kill him, he would have been stoned to death. He wouldn't have been crucified. Uh, so that's, it's kind of interesting that ultimately for for what how Jesus signified how he would die, well, the Jew, the Jews couldn't do it. It was going to ultimately have to be uh, the Romans to do it who used crucifixion. Verse 33, Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Say, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thy own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, they would uh, then my, uh, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Now, of course, that powerful, it's a powerful scene. It's really dramatic. Um, you know, what is truth? And well, that's that's the question our society doesn't seem to believe exists anymore. They don't believe reality even exists anymore. But as Christians, we should care about the truth and we want to discover the truth. And I'm going to use that concept to say that's why we're going to be doing what we're going to do, because we're going to try to discover the truth about a particular text of Scripture. We're going to try to discover the truth about a particular person involved in this story, we're going to try to find the truth um, about the, 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 the text itself. And so to discover truth, to find truth, you first have to believe in truth. You first have to believe truth is important, and you have to commit yourself to discover that truth. And I think even sometimes Christians aren't that interested in discovering the truth. But hopefully everyone will be at least interested enough this morning to participate in this study. Are you ready? So here's what happens. Verse 39. So Pilate comes out and says, look, guys, I, I, I can't find any fault in this person. So he, he, he doesn't want to be involved. He wants, he wants to, uh, you know, wash his hands of the situation. He, he wants to get out of this. 
So he's like, I can't find any fault. So then he, he decides to do this, verse 39. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? And they cried all again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now there's the famous story. There, there stands before the people two individuals, Barabbas and Jesus. One of them can be released. The other one is going to be crucified. And if you read the other accounts, he offers them the opportunity to choose one or the other. They say, no, give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus. Kill him, give us Barabbas. And this sets up this dramatic scene that is so powerful. But is there more to the story? Is there more to what we maybe read on the surface? So let's dig in a little bit and see what we can discover, all right? Now, um, let's start with Barabbas himself, all right? So we're going to be focusing on Barabbas. We're going to be focusing on this man because with with him, I think there is more to what we may think that we know. Uh, There may be more than what we actually, there may be more to what we see in most of our Bibles, so I, let's dig in and see what we can find. First, let's just start with the meaning of Barabbas's name, all right? Barabbas, the name means son of the father, son of the father. Multiple sources may have a somewhat of a variation, but that's typically the basic meaning, son of the father. Keep that in mind, all right? Son of the father, that is what the name Barabbas means. Now, we know a little bit about him. In Matthew 27, 16, um, he is referred to as being a notable, a no, notable or notorious prisoner. All right. So he's well known. He's notorious. He, he's notable in the sense that people know who he is. So when they when he brings out Barabbas, there, there's Jesus and there is Barabbas, and they know they know who this Barabbas is. He was very notorious, very notable, very well known. They, they, it wasn't like, well, who's, who's this other person? No, they know who Barabbas is. They know who Barabbas is, and clearly they know who Jesus is. So it's a choice between two individuals whom they know, whom they've heard of, whom they've heard talked about. Who they, they, they definitely are familiar with both individuals. But let's just start with the fact that Barabbas was a notorious, well-known prisoner. All right? What else do we learn about Barabbas. Well, in uh, Mark chapter 15, verse 7, um, we read this, and there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. So most likely, um, and, and I think this is pretty probably pretty accurate. Barabbas uh, probably had been a part of one of the numerous insurrections against the Roman power. He probably had tried to rise against the Roman power. Uh, what, I, well, I can't say he was a leader of the insurrection, but he pr- definitely probably was one, someone who participated in the insur- in one of the many insurrections that occurred. So this would have possibly made him somewhat popular with the people because obviously they didn't like Rome. Now, obviously, they were tired of their control. So anyone who tried to rise against them, try to bring down the government, would have been seen as a hero almost to the people. So that's probably why he was well known. Hey, did you hear what Barabbas did? Did, he, did you hear how he rose against them? And guess what? Not only was he involved in an insurrection, notice what it says in Mark fifteen seven. he had committed murder in the insurrection. So most likely, and while he was trying to overcome or overthrow, you know, protests, fight against the Roman government, he killed someone. Well, this would have made him very famous. Now, I want you to make sure we see this from a historical context. This is very important. I think many believe Jesus was coming to do the same thing, that he was ultimately going to bring in a kingdom, bring in the overthrow of the Roman uh, the Roman government and set up a kingdom for the Jews. They were ready for an earthly kingdom and an earthly king. And when it became clear that that's not what he was going to do, I think that's when people became very disillusioned and they didn't want him. 
They ultimately decide, we want Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Maybe he can help, uh, you know, lead an insurrection. I mean, there's a lot of speculation there, but I think it's very important to realize that Barabbas is a notable prisoner, well-known, notorious, um, and he was possibly involved in an insurrection against Roman power, and he was considered a murderer. He had killed someone. John chapter 18, verse 40, then cried they all again saying, not this man, but Barabbas, Now, Barabbas, in fact, uh, I think, how does the King James puts it? Uh, John chapter 18, verse 40. Yeah, Barabbas was a robber. He was a robber. Some uh, translations call him a thief. Same idea. So here we, this is what we know about Barabbas. His name means son of the father. He was a notorious prisoner, well-known. Um, he was involved uh, in the, an insurrection, most likely against the Roman power. He had committed murder in the insurrection. He was a robber. Now, all of that is the basic information and story, but is it possible? This is very important. Is it possible that Barabbas wasn't his full name? Is it possible he had a first name? And is it possible that that first name could really add to the story and make it even more dramatic? Well, this is what I want you to do. If you have the ability, open up Google and do a search. I'm going to open up Google right now. Do a search. I'm going to go to Google. Do a search for Matthew 27, 17. Matthew 27, 17. Now on my device, I'm using an iPad. The third, the third choice I can choose from, the first one is Matthew 27, 17 NIV from Bible Gateway. The second one is Matthew 27, 17 KJV from Bible Gateway. And the third choice here is Matthew 27, 17 from BibleHub.com. That's the one I want you to choose if you can, all right? Matthew chapter 27, verse 17. Now, if you open up, if you click on that, you're going to get Bible Hub, Matthew 27, 17, and you're going to note that you're going to get Matthew 27, 17, and you're going to have the citations from multiple translations, from multiple translations, and you're going to see something very interesting because the first translation available to you is the New International Version. The New International Version, Matthew 27, 17, the New International Version, you're going to read this. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? Wait, 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 wait. What just happened? What just happened? Matthew 27, 17, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, as the NIV puts it, who is called the Messiah. Now, if you have, uh, if you have, uh, let me, in fact, I'll pull this up right here. Well, let's just do this. Well, if you've got BibleHub.com uh, Bible open, you've got all the other translations available. So let's remember the New International Version, right? The NIV, let me read it again. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? Now that, that really changes a lot. There's a lot of implications we could take from this, okay? This really adds kind of a... a very powerful, illustrative nature to the story, to the narrative. Go to the New Living Translation. As the crowds gathered before Pilate's house that morning, he asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? Now wait, the New Living Translation, they don't put Jesus before Barabbas. ESV, so when they had gathered Pilate, So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? The ESV doesn't do that as well. Again, the New International Version, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah. New Living Translation just refers to Barabbas by just one name, Barabbas. ESV, same thing, Barabbas. The Berean Berean Study Bible. So when the crowd had assembled, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? 
They only call him Barabbas, the Berean li- a, a literal Bible. Therefore, one of them gathered together, uh, uh, therefore of them being gathered together, Pilate said to them, whom, whom, want, whom want of you that I shall release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? Again, they don't do that as well. The new American standard. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, who do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? They don't do it either. The new King James. Therefore, when when they had gathered together, Pilate, uh, therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said said to them, wow, I'm having problems this morning. Whom do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? New King James doesn't do it as well. King James, same thing. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? They don't as well. Christian Standard Bible, they don't. Contemporary English version. Uh, Now, oh, wait, the contemporary English version. Look what they do. This is interesting. So when the crowd came together, Pilate asked them, Which prisoner do you want me to set free? Do you want Jesus Barabbas? Are Jesus who is called the Messiah? The contemporary English version, they do add Jesus there. Look at the Good News translation. So when the crowd gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to set free for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus called the Messiah? They put it there. All right, look at the Net Bible. If you look at a Hallam Christian Standard Bible, they don't put Jesus Barabbas. They just have Barabbas. The International Standard Version, they don't put Jesus Barabbas. Look at the Net Bible. So after they had assembled, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Christ? All right, so we've got something interesting going on here. There's something going on. We've got a couple of translations who call who calls Barabbas Jesus Barabbas versus Jesus who is called the Messiah. There is this there is this interesting thing going on in some of the text which really adds kind of a powerful picture. There's Pilate standing before everyone and he's and now if we go with these other translations, he's kind of saying, "Hey, which Jesus do you want?" Hey, which Jesus do you want? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who who is called the Messiah? Which one do you want? Then that really adds a little bit of power to the story. But we have to ask ourselves a question. Wait, what, what is going on here? Why is this happening? Why do some translations do this? Why do others, why are others not doing this? So we're going to dig in and we're going to see what we can find. All right. Now, this is now you I've to, we've talked about this a lot at Victory Baptist Church but let's talk about it again. You may want to write down these two words. Textual variant. Textual variant. Now, textual variants exist. I think most average Christians don't know a lot about them. I think a lot of Christians have heard don't worry about textual variants, not my concern. Uh, even if, if, and they kind of do this. I think this is, and you could correct me if I'm wrong. I think the average Christian kind of does this. Well, my Bible says this, that Bible says this. I'm going to go with this one. I'm not going to worry about why they're different. I don't care why they're different. I'm not going to figure out why they're different. I'm just going to choose the Bible that I like. And that's the one I go with. Well, see that, <laughs> uh, that's not good. That's sad. That really is. Because if it's God's word, you should care to know why it's different. You should care to know and you should dig in. And of course, in 2020, there's no excuse why you can't because all the tools are easily available to you. So let's first make sure we understand what a textual variant is. Now, I looked up one definition of a textual variant and I found this and I wasn't a fan of this. This, uh, this difference and tra- the, the the difference in translations is called a textual variant. Now, I, I don't like that that definition at all, and the reason I don't like that definition is because it seems to add and place the variance as something that occurs in translation. All right, now we need we have to go back and remember how this works. All right, so let's just take a minute. 
I know you know this or you should know this. So let's just go back and make sure we understand how this happened. All right. Obviously, God utilized human beings to write down his word. We believe that the writing down of that word occurred under the process of inspiration, that God, that in a sense, God breathed out his word through human beings who then took their physical hand and wrote down the words. Now, we don't believe this occurred through a dictation kind of way, but that God just breathed out that the writer was writing under in other words, their style comes through. There are certain aspects of their personality that comes through. But ultimately, through this, and somewhat of a divine mystery of exactly it happens, because we're we're never really we're never really told how it occurs. We're just told what it is. That what we have here in our hands is the inspired word of God. That the that the original the original manuscripts that were written by the original authors, that those were written under the process of inspiration. All right, but we all know this. Those original manuscripts were then copied and then copies were made of the copies and then copies were made of the copies of the copies of the copies. You get it. They just kept being copied and being copied and being copied. And as a result of all of these copies, you have, here's a manuscript, here's another manuscript. Now, I want to make sure you understand the textual variants appear in the manuscripts. Then when translators come along, they look at all the manuscripts that we have available and guess what they discover? They see all of these variants and then they have to go, huh, this manuscript reads this way. This manuscript reads this way. And then they have to ask a very important question. What did the original say? And they have to then use some different methods to try to determine which reading that they believe is the most accurate and closest to the original. Again, I've stated it again. I've stated it a million times. You've you've probably heard it a billion times. We do not have the original manuscripts. We have copies of copies of copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. And when you look at those different manuscripts, you sometimes go, wait a minute. That says this, but that says this. So in this particular case, we have manuscripts that say Jesus Barabbas. And we've got manuscripts that say only Barabbas. So which is correct? And what does this ultimately mean? Well, we're going to do a little bit of investigating. This is where you have to play detective and you've got to do some study to try to figure out what is going on. Now, one way of finding out more information is by opening an interlinear, all right? Now, if you're gonna, if you're, it, we, now for us, if we look at the King James interlinear, it's not gonna help us too much because obviously there's nothing there that led the King James translators to put it there. But obviously the NIV translators and some other tra- translators, they, they see that it was there. So what can we find? Well, I have here in front of me, um, I have here in front of me the, um, New, the NIV uh, Greek English interlinear. And I have it opened to Matthew 27 verses 15 through 18. All right. Now, if uh, just, I'm going to do this really quick. I think I have it open here. Just so that you know, the word for Jesus in the Greek, I'll just play this for you. Sounds like this. Strong's G twenty four twenty four, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Now it's not so important if you're looking at an interlinear to know how to pronounce it, but Jesus, just so that you know, because I'll reference the the Greek term here a couple of times. The thing is, is knowing what it looks like in the Greek. So if you were reading a Greek New Testament and you saw the word, you're like, oh, there's Jesus. There, there it is. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the interlinear for the NIV. I have it right here, and I'm going to start in verse 15, and I'm going to read uh, the interlinear, um, and and it's not going to sound normal, but I, I want you to just see how it how it would read. Okay, here here's how it would read in the Greek. Okay, uh, this is Matthew 27, starting in verse 15. It would read something like this: Custom now at the festival, it was the governors to release a the by crowd prisoner chosen. 
they had at that time a prisoner well known whose name was, and if I was to read in the Greek, Jesus Barabbas. Jesus Barabbas or Jesus Barabbas. Now, here is the interesting thing in the antilinear. Jesus or Jesus, there are brackets around it. They have the term in brackets. Now, why are they in brackets? The main thing to know is just say that, hey, the, the, the NIV translators are not just making this up. It, it's, it, it was there, but it's in brackets. I want to make sure you understand that. Now, so, so, so why is it in brackets? What is going on? What, what can we discover? So I, I decided I, I had to do more research on this, right? I mean, I could just go with, now, this is what many Christians would do. Hey, it's in the NIV. I use the NIV. Hey, it's Jesus Barabbas. I don't really care that most of the other translations don't have it. Uh, I'm just going to go with that. You can't do that. We got to figure out why. So I had to do some more study. Now this, you won't be able to probably pull up. I've I've got in front of me the Novum uh, Testamentum Greece, all right? Novum and Testamentum Greece. Another way to say that the New Testament in Greece, in Greek, okay? The New Testament in Greek. Now, this is the critical edition of the New Testament, um, and it forms the basis of most modern Bible translate, translations and biblical criticism. It is sometimes known, not as Novum Test, Testamentum uh, Greece, it is sometimes known as the Nessel Allen edition, the Nessel Allen edition, uh, and it's named after its most influential editors. The text uh, edited uh, by the Institute for New Testament Textual Research is currently in the 28th edition, so it's typically abbreviated in academic uh, material as NA28. NA28. All right. So if you were to look at this, and I have it right here in front of me, and they, I've got in front of me Matthew 27, starting in verse 11, all the way down to verse 25, the NA28. Now, if I look at this, uh, I could go verse 11. I'm seeing all the Greek. I'm looking, verse 15. Okay, I'm going, I'm going. I'm like, wait, there it is. Jesus. Oh, wait. It's in brackets. It's in brackets. So, okay, so why why is it in brackets? It's in bra- brackets for the interlinear for the NIV. It's in brackets for the uh for the NA28. Uh, why is it? Cuz clearly, as far as I know, the Greeks didn't use brackets, right? So, why are they here? Well, let's look at a couple of other resources to try to figure out what is going on. Um, I've got a textual commentary on the Greek New Testament by Bruce Metzger. Metzger. Um, now, if you've never heard of Bruce Metzger's commentary, how could I describe it? Uh, y- y- it's basically academic, academic, academic. Okay, it's very, 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 uh, there's a lot of information in it. Let's put it that way. All right, this is not the common thing that the uh, average layperson is going to pick up. All right. Now, if you look at it, if you look at it, they have Matthew twenty seven sixteen. They have Jesus in brackets, Barabbas, and then next to that they have Jesus. Then the word for Barabbas. Then they have a, a C, a C. Now, why do they have the letter C? The letter C indicates that the committee had difficulty in deciding which variant to place in the text. They placed a C there because translators come along and go, wait a minute. This word, this Jesus in brackets, that's a variant. It's in some, it's not in others. What do we do with this? So some leave it out, some include it, all right? So that, that gives you a clue that there was, there was a problem. I can read, I can, uh, I'll read it this way. This is coming from uh, Metzger's uh, commentary on the, on, uh, the Greek New Testament. Uh, the UBS-4 committee, wasn't sure whether the text should be Jesus Barabbas or Barabbas in Greek. After researching, they determined Jesus Barabbas was, in fact, Barabbas's name. However, more, more versions of this account exclude Jesus than include it. The committee thinks that this is out of respect to Jesus the Messiah. So in the end, they left it Jesus Barabbas, but included the brackets to tone it down. 
So this is what happens. And a lot of the uh, the tools used by translators, when they were looking at all the different tools available to them, this is what they discovered. Here is this variant, Jesus Barabbas, but it's in brackets and they put it in brackets. Uh, and so when the translator is looking at this to try, and there's a historical reason for this, to kind of tone it down, to kind of say, hey, out of respect for Jesus who is called the Messiah, we may not want to put Jesus Barabbas. We, we may not want to do this. And so they kind of tried to tone it down by placing it in brackets. All right, that's, that's interesting. We'll get to the history of why that occurred in a minute, but let's continue doing some more research. Now, in on Bible Hub, when you look at all the different translations, um, the Net Bible was one of them that was available. Now, if you don't never heard of the Net Bible, it is a it's a fascinating tool for textual variants, uh, variant fanatics. If you if you love textual variants and you want to just study textual variants, the Net Bible is pretty important. The Bible contains more than sixty thousand notes highlighting every major decision, outlining alternative views, and explaining difficult or non-traditional renderings. Uh, the Net Bible users share, and then, uh, so at that, they placed all these notes together, and then what they did is they found all, all the users who were using Net Bible, they allowed them to share their considerations. The translate, translation committee read through the comments and concerns about about and put out a second edition. Essentially, the, the, the Net Bible is a team effort. So we already know that the Net Bible includes Jesus as Barabbas for as J- Barabbas' first name. They shared that information towards the beginning of uh, the, the, their, their entry, but maybe uh, there is a note that will shed light on why they made this decision similar to the NIV translation. And, and, and I've got the note here, but instead of trying to read it to you, I'm just going to paraphrase it, okay? Because it's very, it gets very wordy and you could get lost. So I'm going to paraphrase. Basically, they believe the stronger reading omits Jesus. However, there is no reason for a scribe to have incorrectly added that name if it did not belong to Barabbas. Also, why would the author then specifically point out and that the second person is Jesus the Messiah? It makes sense that the additional context was added because both men are named Jesus. Now, that's very important. Go back to, uh, is it Matthew 27? I'm going to actually open my Bible to it. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, verse 17. I'm going to read it in the uh, King James. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you? Barabbas. Note the King James doesn't have Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ or Jesus, which is called the Messiah. Why do they make that? Why would Pilate make that clear distinction? I mean, obviously the people down there know who Jesus is. So why do they hate hey, between if both men are called Jesus, then then that uh, that distinction makes a little bit more sense. So they so the, the Net Bible is kind of saying, like, the stronger readings omit Jesus, but it makes no sense that, that someone would just come along at some random time and go, hey, let, let's just throw in Jesus Barabbas here. That if someone inserted it, they probably had a good reason to insert it. And number two, the reading of the text itself seems to, it seems to make sense that both men are called Jesus because he draws a clear distinction Here's Jesus Barabbas, and hey, here this Jesus, he's called the Christ. This Jesus, he's called the Messiah, drawing a distinction between the two men. That's, that's a decent argument, all right? Now, what does history tell us? Now, this is interesting, all right? It is derived, Bar- Barabbas' name is derived ulti- ultimately from the Aramaic which uh, would be son of the father. Some ancient manuscripts, now listen to this, of Matthew 27, 16 through 17, have the full name of Barabbas as Jesus Barabbas. And this was probably the name as originally written in the text. 
So there is a lot of belief that that was the original name. The original name was Jesus Barabbas. That was literally the original name. So what happened? Why does it seem to be missing? What occurred? Well, there's an individual in church history that we may want to blame for this, all right? The The church father origin. The early church father origin. He comes along. And Origen was troubled, bothered by the fact that his copies of the gospel gave Barabbas' name as Jesus Barabbas. When Origen saw that, he was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't like this. I don't like this at all. This this bothers me. Keep this in mind. There's a lot of practical lessons from all of this. We're going to get to them, all right? So guess what he did? Origen comes along and he declared that since it was impossible he could have had such a holy name, the word that Jesus, Jesus, must have been added to Barabbas' name by a heretic. It is possible that later scribes copying the passage removed the name Jesus from Jesus Barabbas to avoid dishonoring the name of Jesus, the Messiah. So Origen thought a heretic put it there. He didn't like it. He didn't want it there. And so they believed that later on, scribes came along and were like, uh, maybe based off what Origen said, maybe based off uh, just a feeling like, ah, I don't want to call Barabbas Jesus. I mean, I don't want to do that. So leave it off, just Barabbas. I mean, it's not going to change the meaning of the text, right? Not going to change the meaning of the text in any way, shape, or form because it's Barabbas and Jesus. The story is still true. Doesn't change the, the anything of, of, of great significance, but does it possibly change a major, a major way of looking at the text? I think that, that it, I think that it does. All right. Now, with, uh, and, 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 and I think this is important. What, I, a note that I have states this. Without knowing that Barabbas' first name is Jesus, we can already see the moral of the story. The crowd chose to release a man incarcerated for murder instead of God incarnate. They didn't choose Jesus, but when we take their names into account, the problems become even clearer. All right, now, so let's, let's stop here for a second. Let's think this through, right? Even if you don't know that Barabbas' first name was possibly Jesus, you still get the basic meaning of the text. You still get the basic power of the story. Here they are, God incarnate or incarcerated prisoner. Well, kill God incarnate. We want the incarcerated prisoner. And why did they want the incarcerated prisoner? Why? Well, they wanted the incarcerated prisoner for personal reasons. They wanted the, the incarcerated prisoner because he was possibly going to, he, I mean, he had possibly tried to fight against Rome. They want, they didn't want Jesus. Jesus had disappointed them. Jesus, Jesus had been spending more time condemning religious leaders, spending more time going into the temple and driving people out with a whip than he was speaking out against Rome. They didn't want, they wanted someone to come out and get rid of their enemies. They wanted a kingdom. They wanted control. They wanted power. They didn't want to be slaves. They didn't want the boot of Rome pressed down on their neck. They wanted their enemies under them. They wanted someone who was going to fight for them, someone who would murder for them, someone who was going to stand. So we can see that, that, that there are reasons for getting rid of Jesus. Jesus disappointed. I, I don't want this person want, r- coming around condemning us, telling us to repent, telling us that we're not being godly enough. I, I don't want that. I want, we want, we want Barabbas. So we can get the meaning of the story. But if his name was Jesus Barabbas, Jesus Barabbas. This is how one put it. If we go with the variant, you end up with Pilate asking this question. Which Jesus do you want? Which Jesus do you want? That is the power of the story. This would not be, and wouldn't this wouldn't be the first, it would not be the last time that people would choose the wrong Jesus and no way, shape, or form. Throughout history, Christians have made Jesus into who they want him to be. 
We have we often choose a Jesus that look, looks a bit more like us physically, politically, or ideologically. The crowd that day did the same and wound up murdering the person who, well, was God incarnate, who had come for them, to save them. Now, ultimately, his death had to occur to save them, but he came to say, to seek and to save the lost. He came to demonstrate the love of God. He came to reveal God to them. He was God in the flesh. He was the creator. He was holy. And they, no, silence. We don't want you anymore. Die. We want this other Jesus. We want this other Jesus. Now, there's some practical lessons from all of this, all right? We went through everything. We went through interlinear, new, uh, the uh, New Testament in Greek. We went through a very famous academic uh, commentary um, on uh, the New Testament in Greek. I've, I, I explained textual variants to you. We went back. We saw how Origen possibly is responsible for this not being there. We went through it all. So there is a lot of lessons we can gain from this this morning, all right? Are you ready? Now let's get very practical. Now, the problem is I'm almost out of time, and now I want to start preaching, right? Now, here I want to start preaching, but that's okay. Just stay with it. If we go over time, we go over time. What are you going to do, right? What are you going to do? you going to get up and leave? Well, I guess, I mean, you're at home. You could just turn off your device. So, all right, here we go. Practical lessons, all right? Practical lessons. I got to take a drink of water. Here we go. Are you ready? Practical lesson number one. This is very, 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 very important. The treasures... That are, that, are, that are contained in the scriptures are often, dis- well, most of the time they are discovered when we are willing to sit down and do study and dig in and take the scriptures apart. That's where we sometimes find things that are fascinating, they're interesting. Now, there's plenty laying right there on the surface, don't get me wrong, but sometimes the truest, I mean, I would think for a Christian, what should bring about some a great amount of joy and excitement and pleasure is when you take the scriptures and you dig in and you discover things that you didn't see before but you've got to be willing to do that kind of work and i want you to just realize that just opening up your bible and reading it no you've got to ask questions i've stated it before i'll state it again the minute you start asking questions that is when you become a theologian And I believe every Christian should be a theologian because every Christian should care about studying God and knowing God. But you're not a theologian until you ask questions. And if you're not a theologian, then there's a problem with your Christianity because you should be a person who is dedicated to studying God, studying his word. You want to grow in your knowledge of God. But you got to study. You have to study. So I think it's very important that that the the truths of, that, that if you really want to discover the truths, you're going to have to study. The treasures are found through digging. The treasures are found through hard work. I think that's a very important principle. Principle number two. This is very important. We learn this from this entire case. There have been people in history. There are people right now. And if we look in the mirror, those people are us. We all have a tendency that if we don't like what a scripture says, we just ignore it. We may not rip it out of our Bible. We may not take a, you know, a marker and and cover it up. We may not do that. We may not take out some white out and just, you know, completely white out a, a, a word. But this is what we do. We ignore what we don't like in scripture. We ignore what makes us uncomfortable. We ignore theology that bothers us. We have a tendency to think that Christianity and the Bible is a buffet and you go through and you take what you want, but it's not. You take what's there. Origen didn't like it. I, I, it, I don't like it. I don't like it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Heretic put it there. You don't do that. When you come to the scriptures and there's things you don't like, you have to embrace and deal with. You don't, you do not change truth by erasing truth. Erasing truth, ignoring truth does not change truth. We, we get so upset with the world right now when they want to ignore, you know, 
the actual genetic makeup of human beings, being a male or a female. We get so mad about how they do that. You're like, no, the gen- genetic makeup. You're either a male, you're either a female. You, you can dress it up and change it and do all kinds of things to the outward body. You can, sur- you can do surgery, you can add, you can take away, you can, dre- you can dress it up, you can use makeup, you can do whatever you want, but it does not change the genetic makeup. Well, guess what, Christians? The same principle is true for us. No matter what we see in the scripture, we may not like it, but ignoring it doesn't make it go away. And we can sit there and condemn Origen for what he did. Now, Origen could be condemned for a lot of other reasons than that, okay? Because, I mean, he was la- you know, labeled a heretic at, at one point in church history. Um, we, could, we, could, we, could, we could, you know, get all upset at Origen, but we do the same thing. We don't like it. We get rid of it. And, and, and that's, that, we cannot do that. We can't approach Scripture like, well, I don't like that. I don't like that doctrine. Eh, can't, can't handle that. No, no we got to determine if it's true. I, I, I witnessed this, you know, in, in my Christian life when I started studying the doctrine of election and predestination and trying to figure out what the words actually meant, and what the text actually says. And then all of the next thing you know, I'm in all kinds of trouble with a pastor who gets all mad at me for, for even trying to, to figure that out. And he didn't, he was, and he, he kept attacking the doctrine more while well, based on a false information, b misrepresentation and c he tried to get all personal and try to make it up. Well, what if what if your child is not one of the elect? Like who? That's irrelevant. It's irrelevant if it makes me uncomfortable. It's if it's irrelevant if it makes me sad. If it, it's irrelevant if it's if it's a horrible thought and I want to just perish the thought. You you don't do theology that way. You don't do Bible study that way. Origins like Jesus Barabbas. No, perish the thought. Can't tolerate it. A heretic put it there. Heretic put it there. Hey, hey, Origin, do you have any evidence that a heretic put it there? No. Well, then stop telling people that a heretic put it there. You heretic? See, see what I did there? That that was kind of funny. All right. I thought that was funny. All right. So we cannot do things that way. That is very, very, very important. All right. So I want you, I want to make sure we get this. The deeper treasures, the deeper treasures are what we we dig for, right? We have to dig dig for them, and we cannot approach Scripture by ignoring what we don't like, or pretending that it's not there, or misrepresenting it, or or whatever, or just trying to dismiss it in any way, shape, or form. We cannot do that. Now, number three, this is very important. When it comes to Jesus, when it comes to God, when it comes to the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, when it comes to any truth about God, listen, we we have to accept God as he is and not try to pick a God to our liking, to our choosing, and to our image. God created, created us in his image We are not to recreate God in our image. So the people stood there, and when Pilate said, which Jesus do you want? They wanted the Jesus of their liking. They wanted the Jesus in their image. They didn't want the Jesus who wouldn't do things the way they wanted him to do things. They didn't want a Jesus who would walk into the temple and drive everyone out. They didn't want a Jesus who condemned all of their religious leaders, calling them all kinds of different things. They didn't want that Jesus. They didn't want a Jesus who seemed to be more friendly to sinners than he was to the religious leaders. They didn't want that. They didn't want a Jesus who in many cases would answer questions with questions. They didn't like that. They didn't like a Jesus who said, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood if you want it. No, I don't know what he's talking about. He's crazy. I'm not, no, don't want anything to do with that. They didn't want a Jesus who, who, you know, I am, you know, basically making himself God. They couldn't, they couldn't, couldn't they couldn't handle it, didn't like it, didn't want it. No. We, we, that's how we sometimes do with God. Okay, I don't want the God of scripture. I want a God that I like. I want a God that likes the things I like. I want the God who, who believes the way I believe. Well, if you want a God, listen, if you want a God who believes the way you believe, who likes the things you like, whose morality conforms to your morality, then let me, let me explain this is what you need to do right now. Stop what you're doing. Put everything down. Go find a mirror. Look in the mirror, there is your God. That God will always agree with you. 
That God will agree with your morality. That God will agree with what you want. That God will be you because that's the God we ultimately want. We want us to be God. Remember, that's the whole reason Satanism, the the Satanism of Anton LaVey came about. Why pretend to, to worship some other God when the God we truly worship is ourselves? That's the God we want. They didn't want Jesus of uh, the, who was called the Christ. They wanted Jesus Barabbas because Jesus Barabbas was like them. He was like them politically, ideologically. And what we try to do, and, and I've said this so many times, we come along and we want a Jesus that, you know, looks like us politically, sounds like us ideologically. It's just amazing that our Jesus, and that's why I get, so, oh, I hate when Christians say, my God, my Jesus. Well, it's not your God, your Jesus. It's God, it's Jesus. When we say my, I know what we're trying to say. My God, my Jesus. We're trying to, uh, you know, because we have a personal relationship, but we got to make sure that that personal relationship, we do not change God. God is beyond us. He's transcendent to us. We submit to him. We don't change him. He doesn't conform to our standards and our image. This story demonstrates that in a powerful way, All right? So to find truth, you got to dig, right? You can't approach Bible study by, by uh, uh, ignoring, removing, erasing what you don't like. And when it comes to God, we have to accept God as he is. We cannot try to change God or pick a God of our choosing, because when we start picking a God of our choosing, we're really picking ourselves to be God. And, 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 and there's, that happens too much within Christianity. Oh, here's a God. My God doesn't condemn homosexuality. My God doesn't condemn uh, women pastors. My God, well, then just forget the God. You're not the God of the Bible. Go, just go worship yourself. Go find a mirror and worship yourself. Bow down to yourself. Build an image of yourself. Go outside and build a statue of yourself and go, here, everyone, here is my God. Yeah, and it's pretty pathetic that that's your God. Because you're pathetic, just as I'm pathetic. So I think we should worship something better than ourselves. All right, but this is another very important thing. This is very important. And I'll end with this. Textual variants. Manuscripts that differ from one another. People in church history not liking this text, uh, or not liking this word, or not liking a certain phrase. This, this is all a part of church history. We have to know this stuff. And the reason is this textual variant, yeah, I mean, you know, it, you may not think it's a big deal. Now, I think it adds to it if the textual variant is right and Jesus does belong there and it is Jesus Barabbas co- contrasted with Jesus called the Christ. I think it adds to the story and it makes it more dramatic and really uh, gives us a, a very powerful illustration. Pilate sitting there saying, which Jesus do you want? That's powerful. And that really uh, is a, a, a challenge to us and, and that we sometimes pick the Jesus we want versus the true Jesus. So there's a lot there. But I just want you to understand that textual variants exist. They're in the Bible. And, they're, and they, at times can be problematic. And at times it makes Christians very uncomfortable. Here's what I think a lot of Christians do. They don't want to address textual variants. They don't want to even address how the canon was formed. They, they don't even want to get into that because it makes them uncomfortable. They're like, I, I don't want to, la, 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 la. Don't tell me about how the canon was formed. La, 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 la. Don't tell me how many, wait, how many textual variants are there? La, 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 la. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. Or they'll just say, well, you know, those textual variants, that, that don't really Im- impact anything. And you're right. A, a large majority of them do not. But there are some sections where textual variants pose some major problems. We have to, why, and why should we know them? Because for some weird reason, it's atheist, agnostics, skeptics, and unbelievers who seem to know more about the canon, how the canon was formed, and the reality of textual variants than people sitting in the pew. Now, you've got to explain that to me. Person in the pew, I don't want to know about the formation of the canon, and I don't want to know about textual variants. Person who doesn't ever go to church, doesn't care, doesn't believe in God. Oh, I want to know about textual variants in the formation of the canon. Well, we're the ones who are supposed to be students of the scriptures. 
We're supposed to be one that is able to give an answer for the hope that lieth within us. We're supposed to be the one who is to teach the truth and speak the truth and help people who believe false information. But we don't want to get there because I think a lot of times once we get there and we start having those arguments with people who know more than us, we feel foolish, we feel dumb, and we start feeling uncomfortable. But let me tell you a very important secret. Truth could care less about your uncomfortable feelings. And ignoring the uncomfortable truth so you don't have to be uncomfortable, is it is not wise, it is foolish, and I will go so far to say it's ungodly. Because what, so this is what we do. Oh, that person over there knows a lot about the Bible I'm going to ignore, I'm going to stay away from that because they're going to tear me into shreds because I'm not going to be able to answer the question. Well, why can't you answer the questions? Oh, because I know you're too busy to actually spend time doing any study. Know what variants exist. And you say, well, how can I know about variants? Well, the Net Bible can help you. There's a start. Read commentaries. There's a start. Check different translations. There's a start. Pay attention. Right? There's a start. Now, of course, it is true from a preaching perspective that you can't in a sermon just deal with every textual variant. You can't. Or every every sermon would be would be like, we're gonna spend six weeks in this passage just looking at variant and why the variants are there. I now I think pass uh when there are serious variants, pastors need to acknowledge it and deal with it from the t- from the pulpit. You can't always do so. Um, again, you have limited amount of time on what you can and cannot cover. But I think as individual Christians, you have a responsibility to, to study your Bible, know what's in it, and know how to use the tools to find it. All those tools that I used, all of them are are available. They're available online. There's different uh, apps. Uh, I could access all of those uh, tools I was able to access. I think I have it right here. Now you have to purchase the tools, uh, but it's called the, uh, is it the Olive, is it Olive, Olive Tree Bible app. The Olive Tree Bible app. Now you have to purchase tools, but the Olive Tree Bible app will give you the ability to purchase some of the very important tools that don't give anything away for free, really. Uh, but you can get dictionaries, atlases, uh, you can get Greek tools, Hebrew tools, you can get uh, interlinears for NIV, you can get everything. And I, that's why I was using that for all the tools that I was referencing um, for this particular hour of study. So you can, and, and again, you don't have to be an expert in all of that stuff. I mean, if you if you don't know what a word looks like in Greek, you look it up uh, and you say, okay, oh yeah, that, that's what it looks like in Greek. And then if you're looking at something that's giving it to you, you just look for the what it looks like. You're like, there it is. Oh wait, there's brackets around it. Okay, why are there brackets around? Okay, oh, there's brackets around it because nobody knew what to do with it. And so someone ended omitted. So, okay, now, so you get to, you get a feel. And so then guess what? When some atheist or agnostic comes along and throws something out, you're like, I know it's there. We studied it in church. Okay, we're not afraid of it, and don't be afraid of it, all right? So there you have it. I'll stop right there. If you have any comments, place them in the chat. I will look at them, and if I need to uh, try to address it, I will either address it there, or if I need to do an additional study on this, we'll talk about it. But I thought it would be an interesting uh, study this morning. I just, I came across, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if I'd heard this before. If I had, I'd forgotten, but I don't know. It was like 1 o'clock in the morning, 1.30 in the morning, 2 in the morning. I don't know what time it was. And I'm like, wait. Why does the NIV have Jesus Barabbas there? And so I'm like, okay, I got to figure this out because I don't remember everything about this. And so that's what led to this. Hopefully now you are, for those, for those who use the NIV, you should have already known why it was there, okay? For those who use the King James, I, I can't blame you because unless you compare the NIV, you didn't even know it existed. I mean, I, 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 I've used the King James, probably that's why I forgot that it was even there. It's probably why I forgot that it was even there, but um, this is uh, this is not a new thing. We didn't discover something new. It's been talked about throughout church history, and you know we can thank Origen for possibly it being omitted from uh, so many translations. So something to consider. All right, we'll be back shortly uh, for the morning uh, sermon. So God bless. I think I'm going to switch everything over to the wireless mic. So it may take me a few minutes to get everything ready. So just don't forget, we still have church next, all right? We have the morning worship service next. So 
do whatever you need to do, and we'll, I'll get started as soon as I can. And we will start under the VBC podcast. And I also am going to have to move this podcast over to the VBC podcast. So please be patient. I'll be back as soon as I can. All right. God bless. And uh, well, we'll talk soon. Mm-hmm.